Welcome to this week's edition of the St. Paul Podcast. I'm Peter Marty, Senior Pastor of St. Paul Lutheran Church, located in the heart of Davenport, Iowa. Right here each week, you can hear a message to inspire your walk with God and hear beautiful music to fill your life. Let this podcast be your occasion to contemplate some of the deepest things in life, just as I hope it helps faith come alive for you. Truth is a slippery concept, especially in a world where all of us are capable of telling lies. 
When does your fudging of the truth or my bending of the truth start to undo us? When does it start to strip us of all integrity? Is it when you tell me you've never hurt anyone? Or when I tell you that I weigh less than I actually do? Well, today I want to think with you about a different kind of truth than the little white lies or sometimes the huge deceptions that fill our lives. I want to press beyond truth being merely a reliable set of facts that we share. Specifically, what if truth is a person? That's actually what we have to conclude if we're going to subscribe to Jesus as Lord. He doesn't only say in John's Gospel that he is the way, the truth, and the life. He also says that if we know him and stake our lives on his life, we will know the truth, and knowing that truth will create some extraordinary freedom in our lives. So listen in on this little passage from John's Gospel, the 8th chapter, beginning at the 31st verse, where Jesus talks about these kinds of things. It reads like this. Jesus said to the Jews who had come to believe in him, If you reside in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are descendants of Abraham and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean when you say you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Very truly I tell you, Everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The child has a place there forever. So if the Son of God makes you free, you will be free indeed. So reads John's eighth chapter. But here now a word on what it might mean for us, not just to tell the truth, but to live the truth. Take a listen. This may come as no surprise to you, but each and every one of us lies. We tell a lot of lies. We're pretty adept at it, frankly. We have this capacity for deceit that seems to be woven into human nature. I guess we could put it under the large umbrella of that condition called sin. But lying has come to be recognized pretty much by everybody as deeply ingrained in our human makeup. Our lies aren't all the same. We tell some big ones. We tell some microscopic ones. We're dishonest in little ways. We're dishonest in big ways. Sometimes we tell a lie to protect ourselves, you know, to cover up some mistake, cover up a misdeed to escape people or to avoid certain persons. Sometimes we tell lies or we fudge the truth to promote ourselves, to seek or gain some economic advantage or some personal advantage. Maybe we tell a lie to make someone laugh or to shape a positive image of ourselves. Sometimes we tell lies that just, well, they impact others. They don't just impact us. Socially, we do this to avoid rudeness. Maliciously, we may do it to hurt other people. Anthropologists and behavioral psychologists tell us we shouldn't be surprised that we have this great talent to deceive other people. They suggest that it probably began or emerged soon after language came around because once we had words to manipulate other people, we didn't need the same kind of force to get what we wanted. Compared to other ways of gaining power, lying is pretty easy. It's much easier if you want to gain someone else's money or someone else's wealth, it's much easier to lie than it is to beat them over the head or to rob a bank. You just have to manipulate words a little bit. And as you're all well aware, our ability as a society to separate truth from lies is kind of under unprecedented threat these years 
as conspiracy theories and disinformation are pretty much the rage. We people are prone to accepting lies that affirm our worldview. And when we're fed falsehoods by people who have particular stature or power or wealth to their name, those lies somehow appear even easier to swallow than other ones. Some of you may know the name Daniel Ariely. Dan Ariely is a big shot psychologist at Duke University. He's all over the airwaves and TED Talk, and he's one of the world's leading experts on lying. About a decade ago, he published this book called The Honest Truth About Dishonesty, How We Lie to Everyone, Especially to Ourselves. Well, in the last two years, if you've watched the news at all, Ariely and a couple of his colleagues are under intense fire for fabricating huge stacks of data that have been the groundwork for many of their academic papers and uh, a number of his eight or ten books that he has published. Even professionals we rely on to tell the truth about lying can disappoint us, evidently. So yeah, we know that lies sever relationships. We know that they abuse the trust of other people around us and that other people may have in us. We know that lies poison the truth. And yet, and yet, we still deploy them. If our untruthfulness comes out in small micro doses, you know, our self esteem stays mostly in place. And I think it's such that when we balance the moral pluses and the moral minuses of our lives, if we're basically heading in positive territory, we feel mostly wonderful about ourselves. But what about that truth that's supposed to organize our lives and be at the center of our spiritual identity? What about that truth that's supposed to be so deeply anchored in us that we won't have any respect for, any desire for, any tolerance of repeat lies and conspiracy theories and disinformation? According to our reading today, One day, uh, Jesus says to some people who believed in him, if you abide in my truth, or if you remain in my truth, you will be my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. In other words, if you hang with me, and stay with me, and remain with me, since I am the truth, I am the way, the truth, and the life, says Jesus. And you continue to learn from me, which is what it means to be a disciple. Well, then you will know the truth. Remember, that's me, says Jesus. And I will set you free for a life you can barely imagine. The word that Jesus uses for truth here means the opposite of being hidden, the opposite of being concealed. It actually means to be exposed, to be revealed. So if you know that ancient fable of truth and falsehood taking a bath in a pool, they climb in there to swim around in that little pool, and falsehood climbs out first, and falsehood dresses himself in the clothes of truth. He then offers his clothes to truth as she climbs out of the water, which she summarily refuses, preferring to remain unclothed rather than to wear the garments of falsehood. And that's where we get the idea of the naked truth. We have falsehood still running around in the world, as I think you know, and it's disguised in the clothing and in the trappings of truth. So what do we need to do to get this truth that's supposed to be organizing our lives, to be at our spiritual center? What do we do to to, to find that truth, to know that truth? Well, here I think it helps to distinguish between telling the truth and living the truth. Or as we had in our prayer of, of 
the day just moments ago, train us, O Lord, to live the truth. It's living the truth that Jesus seems to hope we'll grasp, hope we'll get our hands around. Telling the truth is, is pretty vital. It's about avoiding lies. It's having access to reliable information, willing to trust it, willing to share it. But living the truth is a matter of being a certain kind of person. How do we discover this truthful living? Well, Jesus likens his word to a house. Yeah, a house. If you abide, if you reside, if you remain, if you stay, if you dwell in my word, you're truly my disciples, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Jesus is likening his word, his way, his message, his everything, to a house. So think for a house, think of a house for a moment. You can take your own house, which may have a marvelous kitchen, or a broken front doorbell, or a comfy couch. Hopefully it has a working furnace. You, you may have a bedroom screen that's long overdue for replacement. You may have a marvelous garden now preparing for the winter. But the word of Jesus, that hope, that mystery, that purpose, that everything of Jesus is a place, he says, where you can settle in, where you can make a life, where you can perhaps raise kids, where you can host parties, where you can return for rest. You get the idea. He, he is saying, stay there. Reside there. Consider yourself a permanent guest. There was a funny story out of Italy this week. I don't know if you caught it, but it's about a 75-year-old mother who is trying to evict her two sons from her own house. They are 40 and 42 years old. She's filed a lawsuit against them. In the court documents, they're referred to as parasites <laughs> because they're both gainfully employed and they're contributing absolutely nothing to the household and doing nothing to help with maintenance. And she's spending her entire pension to feed the place and to maintain it. Well, uh, the judge sided with the retired mother and ruled that these two bambo chionis, these two big babies, as it, as it were, have until December 18th to vacate that house in Pavia, Italy. Writes the judge, there is no provision in the legislation which attributes to the adult child the unconditional right to remain in the house exclusively owned by the parents and against their will. Jesus, he's not kicking us out of the house, that house he calls his words. We are permanent guests in that house of the Lord, and we're in it for the long haul. As the psalmist puts it, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. To live and learn what truthful living looks like, to train ourselves in living the truth. Yeah, the couch can be removed and the dishware can be changed, but Jesus says, we're in it for the long haul, and if you can be my disciple, you will learn all about grace and humility with time. I think Jesus is talking this way about his children having a permanent place in his home because truth is more like a person when we're talking about Jesus than it is some set of ideas or a concept or sharing reliable information. We get to take up residence with this Jesus. And we will never be free. We will never be free in a spiritual sense, free to relax into who we're meant to be in this world until we get comfortable as permanent guests trying to learn more and more from this Jesus who is, we learn, the truth. To live the truth is to want to know and is to desire the love of Jesus Christ such that we can be free from all kinds of other anxieties. 
We can be free to serve other people who, who, who are strangers to us. We can do that generously. We can be free not to feel the need to compare people or ourselves with people. In a world that there's some legitimate fear, we can be free to live a little less fearfully, to take some risks now and then that might help mend this broken world. We can be free to be at home in our own skin and not depend on those little white lies that we so often use to promote ourselves. Every time I'm part of a funeral, I think, man, if we could be free to relate to death as more of a familiar guest than a threatening stranger, befriending death at least enough not to treat it as though somebody has just lost a hopeless battle. To live the truth, to inhabit the truth of Jesus is what will help us tell the truth more often, more naturally. My father had a colleague whose family dog bit a neighbor one time. So the man got embroiled, actually, in a lawsuit. He was from Georgia, which was one of the 11 or 12 states in this country that have the one free bite rule book uh, on the statutes in, in the rule of law. Well, uh, an investigator came by Jim's house some weeks after that transgression occurred. He asked if this was the first time that Percy had ever bitten anyone. And Jim was not himself aware of the one-bite rule that condemns a dog for the second bite, presuming that the first one was a mistake, that the second one becomes a pattern. So, as he used to tell the story, uh, Jim's three boys are looking up at him as the investigator asks him the question, is this the first time Percy's ever bitten anyone? All of them knew that Percy had bitten someone else. They loved their dog. They knew their dog was high-spirited, not vicious, high-spirited. They treated both bites as innocent, not as vicious. But since truth-telling is important to this family, and Jim didn't know about the two-bite rule, he mentioned the earlier incident, to which the investigator seemed delighted to know. The insurance company eventually settled out of court, and the family had Percy put to death, an act that they've never forgotten and never quite forgiven. Lying, you know, may help us accomplish an immediate goal. It could have saved Percy's life, but it does not set you free. I know someone in HR, and every time they interview, they always ask the question, could you tell me of a time when you told the truth and it hurt you? Well, that's what Jim did. He told the truth, and it hurt him. But he could tell the truth because he was grounded in this greater truth, the truth that you and I know as Jesus Christ. We get to spend the rest of our lives residing, remaining, dwelling in that word, and that's a beautiful thing because we are, each and every week and each and every one of us, training ourselves to live the truth. Amen. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Love the Lord your God with 
Please join me as we pray together, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. May the Lord train you and me to live the truth and to make truthful living the cornerstone of our lives, the source of real freedom. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I hope you've enjoyed this podcast. And thanks for your support of the ministries of St. Paul Lutheran Church. Our commitment to projects that lend hope to other people stretches across the country and around the world. We hope that in a good way you feel a part of that reach. Tune in next Thursday for another edition of the St. Paul Podcast.